Hey everyone, I'm Simon Harris and welcome to the seventh episode of my vlog. So before I get into today's vlog, I want to say a huge, huge thank you to everyone who watched and engaged with the content that I put out there last week. Um, it was seen over 25,000 times, which I was uh, genuinely humbled by. But what I thought was really positive as well was the debate around the content um, that sprung up around ver verification and fraud. Um, so I think that's fantastic. I think that the industry and the ecosystem will move on along a lot if we're all more open and honest um, around challenges, whether that's uh, you know fraud in data or something else. Um, today I wanted to talk about something which on the face of things might sound a little bit weird for a programmatic vlog. I want to talk about uh, Apple. Um, so why do I want to do that? Well, there's kind of three key reasons basically. So the first one is if you're looking at this and thinking it looks and sounds a little bit better than maybe it has done historically, I bought a new iPhone. So I've got an iPhone 10. Uh, if you think the video looks better, let me know in the comments. Um, so yeah, thinking about Apple products a little bit more maybe than I would have been historically. Um, also on that point, it would have been Steve Jobs' 63rd birthday this weekend. So again, Apple's kind of perhaps more front of mind than it would have been historically, thinking a lot about the kind of uh, impact that he had on the world and the legacy that he left. Um, but thirdly, and, and this kind of brings it home for me specifically, I read a stat at the weekend that um, iOS 11 has now been downloaded on 65% of all Apple's mobile devices, which um, is an incredible adoption rate. Um, but obviously with the advent of iOS 11 and its massive adoption comes with it some challenges for marketers. So some of you will be familiar with um, iOS 11 and the fact that Safari that's bundled in with that and is uh, iOS 11's default browser has something called intelligent tracking prevention in it. Um, that's something that's created big problems for marketers in kind of two key ways. Um, but before we get into that, we should probably take a step back and explain actually what intelligent tracking prevention is. So intelligent tracking prevention is a feature that's bundled in with Safari on both of Apple's latest operating systems. So as I just mentioned a second ago, that's iOS 11, and it's also on uh, Mac OS High Sierra. Um, and for those of you who are unaware, Safari is based on something called WebKit. Now WebKit is an open source rendering engine that's uh, created by Apple, and it's always been quite uh, uh, aggressive when it comes to how it treats cookies and uh, how it actually blocks tracking but ITP really ratchets that up to another level um, in the way that it partitions cookies so um, when someone visits a publisher or a client's website after 24 hours the cookie is partitioned in a way which means that it will no longer allow for cross-site tracking and the kind of the throttling of cross-site tracking is really what causes problems for advertisers in two key ways. So the first way that it really impacts campaigns is it reduces the size of your remarketing pools because obviously after a 24-hour period, someone that was in your remarketing pool will drop out of that cookie pool. Um, and secondly, it plays havoc with uh, cookie-based attribution because obviously after a 24-hour period, um, reporting that would have historically been based on uh, cookies, so let's take your, your average DCM report, uh, no longer works because that cookie's been in a, partitioned in a way that it's no longer usable um, because it can't be read cross site. So um, that's really the uh, impact of intelligent tracking prevention on marketing campaigns. And I guess at this point you're probably thinking, well, that doesn't sound particularly great. Uh, what can I do? And that's what we're going to get into right now. Okay, so at this point, you're probably thinking, this doesn't sound great at all for my campaigns. And if you're one of those people, you're absolutely right. Ultimately, iOS 11 is on 65% of iOS devices, right? And we know for a fact that uh, Safari on iOS has a 50% share of mobile browsers in the UK. So what that actually means is that a third of all browsers in the UK have issues when it comes to being able to address the person at the end of that browser or tracking that person uh, post view. And that's obviously like, that's not great. Um, so what can you do about it? Well, the obvious one, if you work for a company that's DSP selective, 
technology select, if I should say, is adopt a DSP which has a deterministic device graph. So here, Amazon's your obvious bet. Um, if Amazon's not your jam, you could probably go for a DSP which has a probabilistic device graph for both targeting and analytics. And here I'm probably thinking something like an ad form or a trade desk might be appropriate. But there'll be maybe 40 or 50% of the market, right, who are using that DCM-DBM hybrid, where that's, that's not an option, right? You have to use that DSP. So for those guys, what can you do? Um, it's a fair question, and we're going to dive into it now. Keep it on the level. Keep it on the level. Okay, so having people drop out of your cookie pools after a 24 hour period is not great at all. Um, I wish I could work miracles and help you with that, unfortunately I can't. Um, what I could tell you that you can do um, if you're using that DCM DBM hybrid is create something called a similar audience, right? That's a free of charge lookalike model. And you can't say for absolute certain that the people that are dropped out of that uh, cookie pool will definitely be targeted, but it's certainly better than doing nothing and watching your cookie pools dwindle to nothing. Um, what I would say here, um, obviously, is you're gonna need to, to keep an eye on performance, right? Because you know a deterministic cookie pool, generally speaking, is gonna um, outperform a lookalike model. Um, obviously, that's gonna be uh, harder to, to kind of measure because of intelligent tracking prevention itself, but that's something we'll come on to in a little bit. Um, beyond this, what can you do? Well, you know, if your clients are, you know, you know they're your customers are gonna be in market for specific products, so in market for travel or consumer electronics or whatever it is, I strongly, strongly suggest that you, um, you know, you use uh, the second party data that's available um, in Bid Manager and also test that and benchmark that against uh, third party segments as well. Um, obviously, when you're benchmarking success, you need to look at your client's uh, KPI and that's preferably gonna be uh, a CPA uh, or a ROAS goal. Um, and actually, because of intelligent tracking prevention, because it also impacts attribution, that becomes much, much harder to do. So in that situation, what I would suggest that you do is you look at your client's DMP or reports that might be available to you in DCM or DBM um, to understand which audiences convert well before your campaign's in flight, right? And then that way you know from the word go that you're gonna be targeting those right segments um, because for sure you're gonna have uh, some issues in flight that maybe you didn't experience before when it comes to collecting uh, statistically significant samples on uh, you know your CPA or your ROAS goals um, what can you do beyond this um, well the first thing that I would say is from an attribution perspective is if you're not using cross-environment reporting already you 100% should be um, obviously consumers live in a cross-environment world you need to be making sure that you're also um, reflecting that in your your client side reporting so i suggest that you know with the advent of itp being in uh you know like maybe a third of uh, uk browsers that's definitely some way where you should start um beyond this i think google announced something which is really really interesting which is called their global site tag and i think for advertisers who have uh slightly more sophisticated needs than perhaps uh, in console reporting from the double click stack will provide i think that's definitely a, a route to invest investigate for your advertisers. So uh, a few things that you can do there from a targeting perspective, a few things that you can do there as well from a reporting perspective. Hopefully that helps. Um, if you've thought of innovative strategies that you know might shift the dial in the right direction, let me know in the comments as well. Always really interested to have a debate on this and talk to other traders on the subject. Okay, that's it from me for now. Don't forget, if you've enjoyed this episode of the vlog, please smash subscribe on YouTube, give it a share on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, as I said, I'm super stoked by the view count, but what I think I'm most humbled by is the amount of conversation that creating this vlog has actually uh, created online. Um, I think that's fantastic. Um, I think the debate in public is super important because you know there's always lots of concerns around transparency and how all of this stuff actually works. So please keep that up. Um, really stoked about that. I'm gonna be talking about a really, really interesting uh, topic on Thursday. Hopefully it won't get me in too much trouble. I'm going to be looking at whether or not large companies that straddle the buy and the sell side are inherently conflicted by serving both publishers and agencies. Uh, I hope that won't land me in too much trouble. It's definitely going to be interesting, so keep your eyes peeled for that, and I'll see you in the next one. I can do this all day, I can do this all night. I can, I can, I can do this all day, I can do this all night. I can